blessings everybody and welcome to Stellar Maze. Before I get into this video, I would like to make a small clarification. I was justly pointed out that the Russian word красивый, meaning beautiful, did not originate from the Russian word красный, meaning red. It was actually vice versa. There was actually an old Slavic root, krasa, which means beauty. And when people looked at red, they said, oh, this is a beautiful color, so they called it krasny, which I totally agree with. The old Russian word for red is actually чермный, which is similar to red in other languages, such as червоны in Ukrainian, червоны in Belarusian, червоны in Polish, червоны in Czech, and yeah, you get the point. Now, in this video, I was going to talk about the headwear. In the last video, I promised to touch a little bit on the Tatar headwear, and I thought it was a little bit unfair to nearby Slavic countries, so I decided to delve into Russian culture and also into the Belarusian culture, and eventually I fell into a rabbit hole of information. Originally, I was planning to talk about the women's headwear in the first half of this video, and the men's in the second, but then this video would just become too long, and I decided to divide it into two. In this one, I'll be looking over the women's headwear. Now, Headwear in Slavic culture was very important. It was a marker of status, age, family situation, regional demographic. Just by looking at a woman's headwear, one can say whether or not she is married, how many children she has, and how old she is. So all in all, headwear was very important back in the day. Much of the headwear that I'll be covering here is also fairly complicated, so women would be helping each other to set those up. And you're gonna see what I'm talking about in just a moment. Traditional Slavic women would change their headwear in accordance to a life stage. And the most common division is between the married and the unmarried. Let's begin with the latter. Children until the age of 8 would usually not wear any type of headwear. Since child mortality was fairly high back in the day, children would sometimes be seen as random guests unsure whether or not they're gonna survive to grow up. Once they pass the 8-year-old marker, they would start getting their own hats. Girls would usually wear headbands, flower wreaths, corons, most of which would have their hair exposed. Perivaska is a word for a headband, which is one of the most ancient examples. It would oftentimes be decorated with beads and embroidery. Tied behind the head, the ends would usually drape, their length being a marker of status. Obruch, which literally means hoop, was made out of tree bark such as oak or walnut and was basically a hardened version of Pirivaska. Vinok, or the flower wreath, was a staple headwear of Eastern Slavic girls, worn since the age of 15, which was when they were considered ready to marry. The flower symbolized not only beauty, but also virginity and purity. Therefore, to lose a headdress like this would not look very good. There is an old practice of sending this flower wreath down a river, which is a sort of uh, foretelling magic. If the flower wreath flew down the river, then that means the girl would get married. If it stayed in one place, then the opposite. If the currents were rough, then that would probably reference a hard life, and if the flower wreath would sink, then I guess you can imagine what it means. In an artistic style, a bachelor can jump into the river and retrieve the flower wreath and return it to the girl as a request for marriage. Eastern Slavic girls would also wear colorful ribbons or bands. In Belarus, these bands would be collected into a headdress called the kubak. And with that, let's transition to the next stage of a woman's life, being married. This was perhaps one of the most important transitional phases in a woman's life, accompanied by a load of rituals and practices. For example, an unmarried girl would usually have one braid, but when she gets married, her braid would be disassembled by her friends, combed and reassembled into two braids, and put in a circle around her head. Just as important, or perhaps the most important trait of a married woman in Slavic culture, was having her hair covered. Hair was considered to have some magical power, and when undone, was a symbol of liberty, as well as uncivility. The phrase, to shine with hair, meant to have your hair exposed. 
whenever a married woman would shine with her hair, that would be considered very shameful. Sometimes it was believed that if a married woman would show her hair, then it can cause misfortune and evil spirits to enter her house. Having your hair done and covered could also be interpreted as a symbol of submission. In that regard, the misfortunes that would arise with uncovered hair could be interpreted as a metaphor for the consequences of untamed or arrogant behavior. A married woman would receive her new headwear on a waiting day, usually from her mother-in-law, or sometimes from her father-in-law. Sometimes this headwear would be rather complicated to put on, which would require the assistance of friends. The most dominant design would be a cap that would stretch around the head and usually tied at the back. In Ukraine, that would be an achipok, in Russia, it'll be a pavoynik or a podbrusnik, and in Belarus, it'll be a chipets or a kaptur. Its prominence is mostly due to its practicality. It's useful when working and fairly simple when compared to others. Towards the 19th century, this type of headwear would replace most others. Another dominant example is a kerchief. It comes in various forms, called many different things such as towels, shawls, veils, scarves, ubrus, and could serve on its own or assembled with other headwears. It also replaced many of the traditional headwears towards the 19th century. Namitka, sometimes translated as the wimple, is perhaps the most recognizable example. By now it's mostly gone from Ukraine, but still thrives in Belarus. This large piece of fabric would be wrapped around the head, usually with a cap, and then tied behind the head with the ends draping. The longer the ends, the higher the status. It would usually be made out of linen or hemp. This would make it light and breathable and would be useful in protecting against the sun. This separates it from a different form, the hustka, which is made from heavier fabric. A Ukrainian culture group, the Hutsuls, have a similar headdress that they call Perimitka or Perimotka, which literally means wrapped around. Now, let's get into the crazy world of the Russian hats. In southwest Russia exists my personal favorite, the Kika, or sometimes the Kichka. First written records of this headwear appeared in 1328, but have become practically extinct nowadays. If you think this headdress looks like the head of some demon, then you would understand the position of the church, which was one of the reasons why this headwear did not survive until today. Remnants of this style would survive in the kerchiefs. Sometimes women would tie their kerchiefs on the front, with the ends pointing up like two small horns. These horns are supposed to symbolize the horns of a cow, symbols of fertility as well as childbirth. For logical reasons, the older woman would not wear them. There were several different types. There was a horned kika, hoofed kika, shovel kika, which was worn after the first childbirth. All of these would be worn by the early married woman and would sometimes be referred as the crown of marriage. This one was fairly complicated to assemble. First would go some kerchief or a zdericha wrapped around the head. Then would go a pazatilnik, which would cover the nape, hanging pendulums, and other decorations, and at last the kichka itself. In the Areol region, they would also put a lobazna, which was an additional white forehead piece on the front, and it would be worn by a woman before the first child. Kichka would oftentimes be assembled with, or confused with, the following one, saroka, literally translated as the magpie. The magpie is called that way for its avian shape, this piece of fabric would have a head, or an achelia, wrapped around the forehead, wings wrapped around the sides of the head, and sometimes a tail wrapped overhead. The magpie's head would sport elaborate decorations, usually from embroidery, beads, pearls, and so on. At one point in the Kargapol region, it was actually put into law for the merchant wife to decorate her magpie with golden threads. One of the most common decorations on the magpie's forehead is what they call a pretty frog. This headwear would be worn after the birth of the first child, and the pretty frog is actually a stylized symbol of childbirth. The magpie would be wrapped around the pavonik, or as or around the kika, 
and for a cherry on top, it would usually be covered by a shawl or a kerchief. I guess these people just like putting matryoshkas on their heads. In a Tula region, they had something like this. This was also a magpie, but its tail was made into a circle of ribbons, much like a peacock. At last, we come to the most iconic Russian hat ever, the Kokoshnik. This one usually belonged to the northern regions and is prominent in much of Russian art and literature. You may recognize it from the Snegurochka. First written records of the Kokoshnik date back to the 17th century, but the headwear was probably much older, maybe from the 10th or the 12th century. Its origins are still unknown, and it is suggested that they came from the Byzantines. The word kakosh means chicken, probably denoting the idea of a crest. In either case, this headwear was worn for a long time by the Russian woman, and when Peter the Great came along, he thought it was too archaic and decided to ban it. Despite of his efforts, the kakoshnik returned. There are many different types, one-horned, two-horned, cylindrical, conical, saddle-shaped, squared. I'm not sure how real this one is, but it is just too gorgeous to not include. The kakoshnik was rather hard to make and was usually limited to the better off and passed down through the generations. The kakoshnik was richly decorated with embroidery, beads, pearls. The primary designs are the S-shaped swans or the tree of life. Swans and geese represent marriage and filial integrity, meanwhile the tree of life represent generations and motherhood. The kakoshnik would oftentimes be made with a beaded nets over the forehead, and a kerchief or an ubrus would be attached to its crown, hanging over the back or fixed over the neck. Unlike the other headwears mentioned, this one was not exclusive to the married ones, and girls would wear it as well. It depended on the region. One of the headdresses that is oftentimes confused with the kakoshnik is the vignettes or the crown. This one is traditionally worn in the Archangel region and identifies as its own thing. There was also the shashak, called so for the pine cones that were attached to it. The pine cones are supposed to be symbolic of how many children you're going to get. So if you look at this one, yeah, that's, that's interesting. There was also the zbornik, which literally means the collection, and its crown was made out of compressed fabric. It was cheaper to make than the traditional kakoshnik. It would also be called a morshen, which means wrinkled, or in the 17th century, the shamshura, which means smashed. So yeah, you get the point. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the Slavic headwears. Now I'm gonna real quick jump over to the Crimean Tatars. These are a Turkic Muslim minority originating from the 13th century. Their national wear was designed in the 18th century, although its elements are way older. The woman's hat, the kalfak, originally started out as a simple cap, but later on grew to many different shapes and sizes. It acquired elaborate embroidery, gold and silver threads, beads, pearls, coins, fringe and tassel, and elaborate jewelry, for which the Tatars are famous. In the 19th century, the kalfak would shrink in size and would oftentimes be covered by a shawl or a veil. Just like the Slavic people, the married woman would hide their hair. White colors would symbolize old age and mourning, meanwhile red would symbolize generosity and wealth. Alright, I hope you enjoyed it. This is a time when you put a like. Now let's get to the senescent culture. As announced in the previous video, I drew the ceremonial attire on sun-related festivals, this attire is supposed to soak in the divine solar energy, and when Han indoors, it was supposed to spread good luck and fortune. If it were somehow lost, that would spell disaster for the family. Concerning the headwear, they would wear the kvita, which literally means flower. The flower is its primary design, usually bearing some sort of a precious stone in the center. Throughout this headdress, would be implemented many swirls, which are symbolic of solar energy. This one is fairly complicated to make and expensive, and would oftentimes be passed down through generations. At first, the woman would assemble her hair under a kerchief or as dirija. The kvita would be put over the forehead and attached using a magpie. 
on the magpie's forehead, you can see my take on the pretty frog. At the very end, this would be wrapped around with a namitka and adorned with additional jewelry. So yeah, this brings me to the conclusion. The next Saturday, I'll be discussing male headwear, and I'll be drawing what a senescent man would wear. A shout out to the third rooster. You can find them on Instagram with a gallery of some of the most stunning headwear inspired by Ukrainian culture. I've been looking through some of their posts, being absolutely blown away by how much creativity and labor went into this. As always, if you like this video, don't forget to like it, a bit more literally. And if you're looking forward to the next video, make sure to subscribe to stay on the lookout. And you may choose to follow me on Instagram. In any case, have a charming day and see you in the next Sobota.